The hospital needs it more than I do. Besides, I'm probably going to spend it on stuff that'll rot my teeth and my mind. <laughs> ah, that's, that's very sweet of you. Hey, you see that tree there? Hmm? Well, to show our appreciation for your generosity, I'm going to let you select an object from that tree that you can take home with you. Free? We, uh, uh, may, may I make a suggestion? Okay. Take the turtle doves. I could have two? Well, two turtle doves. And I tell you what you do. You keep one, and you give the other one to a very special person. You see, turtle doves are a symbol of friendship and love. Now, as long as each of you have your turtle dove, You'll be friends forever. Wow. I never knew that. Also, they were just part of a song. They are. And, and, and for that very special reason. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but when I see Mr. Duncan, I just want to give him a big hug. Because he's so warm and like lovable and full of joy and care and he loves kids and he's humble. This whole conversation, he was talking to Kevin about how all the proceeds from Christmas Eve, he's going to donate to the children's hospital. And the whole time he was talking in third person, he said, Mr. Duncan, we'll just take it on down to the hospital. It's because he was, he didn't want to bring praise and glory to himself, right? He was humble. And so when I see someone like Mr. Duncan, I just want to go have coffee with him. You know, like sit down with him, pick his brain, ask him like, how did you become you? Like, you're just so awesome. I want to be like you when I grow up. And I think there's so much that we can learn from older men and women of God in the body of Christ. There is so much experience, so much perspective that we can glean from them wisdom from having lived through every season of life, steadfast, faithful in their pursuit of God. I mean, I'm, I haven't lived through all the seasons of life yet, but someone who has can, can teach and we can learn and, and we can grab nuggets of wisdom from them. And so something really special about Luke chapter 2 and this narrative of the birth of Jesus is that he highlights two Mr. Duncan-like characters um, in the birth story of Jesus. And, uh, and so I want to take this time today to zoom in to their lives and see what we can learn from them. So the title of my message today is The Ways of the Wise. Ways of the wise. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your presence. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here. You are with us. And Lord, we want to learn from you and from your word. So Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, well, we are going to be concluding our Advent series this morning, Rejoice, where we've been walking through Luke's chapter one and two, and each week we focused in on a particular character in the story and how joy has shown itself in their experience and encounter with Jesus. So Risa kicked us off, uh, and she talked about Mary last week. Rob talked about the shepherds, and the angels brought good tidings of great joy for all people. But this week, we're going to focus in on Simeon and Anna. So these are a little bit more obscure characters in the story. We don't hear as much about them, but there's a lot that we can learn from their lives. So our story picks up. Jesus has been born. Um, the shepherds have visited him. The angels came. All that happened. And then eight days later, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to be circumcised in the temple. And then they also dedicate Jesus to the Lord. This is something that the Jewish people did. They would dedicate their firstborn son to the Lord with an offering and a sacrifice. And oddly enough, the sacrifice for the firstborn son was two turtle doves. Um, but so they, so they go to the temple to offer a sacrifice and an offering to dedicate Jesus 
to the Lord. And while they're in the temple, this, this man shows up, Simeon, right? And it doesn't say that he's a priest. It doesn't say that he's anything. He's just a guy, right, who shows up. And it says that he's righteous and just and devout. It says that he is uh, waiting and eagerly longing for the coming of the Messiah and the redemption of Israel. And he's full of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit leads him into the temple at the same time that Mary and Joseph are there, right? And God had told him that he would see his salvation before he passed away. So Simeon's there. Uh, Mary and Joseph come to the temple and the Bible says that Simeon took the baby from Mary, which that would be alarming for all you mothers in here. If someone, you come in with your eight day old child and someone's like, ha, and he starts blessing God. You know, uh, that would be strange, right? But it's exactly what happens. I mean, he comes, he takes the child, he starts blessing God and worshiping. He's saying, God, thank you, Lord, that you've given me favor so now your servant can die in peace, Um, which I'm sure Mary was thinking, what is going on? Um, And he says that he's a light to the Gentiles. He's going to restore glory to the people of Israel. And then what I love, I love this little line. It says that Simeon blessed Mary and Joseph. This older man of God lays his hands on Mary and Joseph and speaks a blessing over them. How special is that? And he continues to prophesy over Jesus. Now, at the same time in the temple, Anna is there. Now, Anna is 84 years old, it says. She's a widow for a long time, been spending all this time in the temple. And she just happens to kind of be walking by, I guess, and overhears this conversation, Simeon speaking all these things over baby Jesus. And she doesn't run to baby Jesus and hold him. No, it says that she praises God. And then she starts going and telling everybody that's been waiting for the redemption of Israel. Hey, he's here. Salvation has come. And she preaches that message to anyone who will listen. So there's a lot that we can learn from Simeon and Anna, and they have a lot of similarities. Uh, They were both there, right, at the same time in the same story in the temple. Both of them were at the end of their lives. Uh, It says that Anna was 84. Some believe that she was 84 years a widow, which would mean she would be like 100 and something. So she was up there, okay? And then Simeon, it says, you know, he says that your servant can die in peace now that I've seen your salvation. And typically that's not something that a 30 year old says, you know? Um, So he's, I'm guessing he was also towards the end of his life as well. Uh, And they were both prophets. So Simeon, uh, he prophesied over Jesus. And then Anna, it says, was a prophetess. So that she was known as a prophet herself. Also, they were both devoted to God. I mean, devoted. Simeon, throughout his life, devoted to Jesus. Devout, just, righteous, eagerly waiting and longing for the coming of the Messiah. Full of the Holy Spirit. Anna, living in the temple, day and night, praying and fasting and worshiping God. They were devoted. Now, it's one thing to be devoted. It's another thing to be devoted throughout your life consistently steadfast in their pursuit of God, in their love for him and his commandments, in in being in his presence in the temple. Both of them had this throughout their lives. And and Anna, she, she had her husband pass away after seven years of marriage, which that is, I can't imagine the grief that she had to endure because of the loss of her husband so early in her life. And she never got remarried. She never had a family, as far as we know. But yet she stayed steadfast in her pursuit of God and her hope. And you see it in their story. They were so full of hope and joy when Jesus shows up on the scene, praising God, telling the people. So the question is, how did they have that steadfast joy and hope? And how do we cultivate steadfast joy. We've been talking about joy and and how it comes in God's presence, all these different things. How do we have it consistently in our lives um, where it doesn't waver? And I think we see that in the lives of Anna and Simeon. So Luke chapter 2, verse 37, this is talking about Anna. 
It says that she did not depart from the temple, like ever, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day constantly in the temple, serving God, present before him at all times, burning for God, burning for Jesus. Look at Psalms 27, 4, what David said about seeking God. He said, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. And Anna was doing this in the temple. She took David's advice literally, like she did not depart from the temple. But she was worshiping him day and night. She was delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating on his character. See, something that we see in Simeon and Anna's life is that they made space for encounter with God. And for us to cultivate steadfast joy in our lives, we have to create space for encounter with Jesus. You know, everything we have, we we understand everything we need is, is in him, right? Joy, peace, love, patience, all of that stuff is fruit of the spirit. But if we don't have any space or any room in our lives to encounter God, then those truths and that reality won't be our reality because it comes with an encounter with him in his presence, it's his spirit. And so we have to make space. Another thing that happens when we do this is that, and you see this in the lives of Anna and Simeon, is that this indestructible longing and hope was stirred up inside of them as they were creating room for God in their life. Indestructible hope, insurmountable, that would not be shaken no matter what happened in their life, no matter what sorrow came, it was steadfast and it was centered on being with Jesus. They had a hope not only that they would be with him one day and perpetually forever with him and in his presence with fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, but that in this present moment, they had an expectation that God would reveal himself and sure enough, he did. You see, joy is an attitude the people of God adopt not because of happy circumstances, but because of the hope they have in God's love and promises. The hope that they have in him. Hope and joy work together. Joy or hope sustains joy. And then joy also sustains hope. They work together. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anna and Simeon hungered and thirsted for righteousness and they were filled. And that was the promise from Jesus. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled Jeremiah says that if you seek me, God says, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. And they sought him with all of their heart and they found him, like literally found him. (laughs) They found God incarnate in the baby. They found God because this hope does not disappoint. The hope that we have in God does not disappoint. In fact, when we create space to encounter God in that time, God strengthens our hope with guarantees guarantees in his word, guarantees from his presence. Romans 5, 5 says this hope doesn't disappoint because we know how dearly God loves us and he's given us the Holy Spirit who pours out his love in our hearts. So God's giving us his love when we're in his presence as a foretaste of what is to come. So here's a little preview of what it's like to be in my presence perpetually. And it's just assurance, this is coming. Nothing can touch your hope. Promises of God in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, it talks about how our inheritance is in heaven and it cannot be touched by this world. Moth and rust cannot destroy. Thieves cannot break in and steal. That's where we store up our treasure is in heaven and nothing, no matter what happens in this present life, circumstances, conditions of life, hardship, nothing can touch our hope 
It transcends anything that happens here. None of those things can touch it. In 1 Corinthians, it says that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. Wow. Romans 8 says that our current suffering is not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, it says, is the hope of glory. And he says that Christ in us is the assurance that we will share in God's glory. And in Ephesians 1, it says that when we accept Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit as a deposit, as in a guarantee of our inheritance with him. So nothing can touch that hope. No matter what happens in our life, that hope remains steadfast. And because of that, when we cling to that hope, we can have joy. In the midst of hardship, even in the midst of sorrow, we can have joy. The hope that God gives us is so strong that joy and sorrow can coexist together simultaneously. Let's look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians verse 6. Sorry, chapter 6, verse 10. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. Wait, what? Our hearts ache, but we always have joy together. I mean, Jesus, when he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he told Martha and Mary, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Your, your brother's going to live. He, like he tells him, confident hope. And yet right after that, it says that he weeps. We can have joy and sorrow together because joy is not the absence of sorrow. Joy allows us to engage our sorrow in a healthy way without it overcoming us. We can engage our sorrow in a healthy way because sorrow is good. It's something that God has created for us, for our healing. That when we weep, when we have sadness, it's like a, it's like a pressure valve that we release and then all of that pressure, all the stuff that's inside of us as we grieve comes out and then God can restore us from within with his peace. Now, our culture has a couple of different ways of approaching sorrow that are unhealthy. One is we suppress it and two, we succumb to it. We're overcome by it. So one, we suppress it through false hopes. So we look at short-term solutions and we say, okay, this will fix my sorrow. So I'm going to put my hope in this thing, whether it's entertainment, whether it's a relationship, whether it's our phone, whatever it is, we try to, uh, to, uh, to reject and, and to get around our sorrow instead of engaging it. And we suppress it through these false hopes. And the problem with that is, is that pleasure can't combat sorrow. It never works. And so when we put our hope in all these different things, what happens is it perpetuates it and it turns sorrow into despair and hopelessness because the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick, right? And so if we put our hope in something and then it doesn't fulfill us, heart sick. So we do something else, put our hope in this, doesn't fulfill us, heart sick, heart sick, heart sick. And then what happens? We lose hope and we become desperate, we're in despair, and there's, we're, we're experiencing hopelessness and discouragement because we've been placing our hope in things that won't fulfill us. If we're gonna cultivate a steadfast joy, we have to reject false hopes. Simeon, the Bible says, was devout, which means, uh, that, that word actually in the Greek means that he was careful and cautious. So he was intentional about where he was putting his hope. Now, I'm sure he wasn't perfect, but you saw at the end of his life that his longing was in Jesus. Psalms 39, 6 and 7 says, We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. See, pleasure, people can't carry the weight of our hope. 
Because our expectation, what we really want is health, healing, and wholeness. And no one can meet that. They, any, any person, we place that expectation on them, they'll crumble under the weight of that expectation. Anything we put that expectation on, it'll crumble under the weight of that. But Jesus can carry the weight of our hope. And he can fulfill it. Only him. And so if we're not suppressing our sorrow, then another thing that we can fall into is succumbing to it, being overcome by sorrow and grief to where all we can see is sorrow. Now, Anna gives us an example of how to deal with our sorrows because she herself literally was grieving. I mean, she lost her husband after seven years, was a grieving widow, but what did she do? She engaged her sorrow, but she also went to the temple, the Bible says, and was praying and fasting. She brought her sorrow to Jesus. In order to cultivate steadfast joy, we need to engage sorrow, absolutely. Acknowledge it, feel it, own it, experience it. It's good, we need to do that. But then we also need to relinquish it to Jesus and give it to him ultimately. And then he can heal our hearts. David did this in Psalms 42, verse four and five. He says, my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. So he's engaging his sorrow. But then he says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my savior and my God. Right when David was about to go under, when he was about to drown in his sorrows, what does he do? He clings to the hope that can't be touched by his current circumstances and conditions. And he clings to that and he says, God, remind me of my hope. It's in you. You are everything that I need. You're the one who's gonna meet my needs. You're the one who's gonna give me joy. You're the one who's gonna give me life. And he clings to God in that moment. That is the hope that we have. That is the joy that we have. And then you see it. Throughout the Psalms, he has Psalm after Psalm saying, shout, sing for joy. My joy is found in the Lord. But David went through some of the most difficult times and most incredible hardships. But yet, he clung to that hope. And then the last thing that we see in the lives of Simeon and Anna is that their joy was anchored in love. They laid the foundation of love for God and for others. We see it. So Simeon, it says that he had a deep longing for the redemption of Simeon? No, for the redemption of Israel, for the people of God. His hope was that the people of God might be restored. It was full of love. And then Anna's first response in hearing about Jesus was not to go and take Jesus and hold him in her arms. Look, salvation has come to me. No, it says that she went out and told everyone her first response, both of them. The first response was praise first, love for God, and then proclamation, love for people. They laid the foundation of love. And so their hope was founded on that. Their joy was founded in that. And I think this is something that happens over time as we mature through the years. God refines our hopes to where they're not completely centered on us. That our hope becomes something bigger than us, bigger than our lives and for others. And Jesus promises in John 15, he says, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And he has an exclamation mark. He's yelling it. This is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. He says, man, when you love God, you love people, then my joy will remain in you. How many of you guys, you know that you've had that experience. When you go to serve someone else, when you go to love someone else, your heart gets filled with joy, right? Yes, right? Our joy is made full when we live our lives for others. We, so it makes our lives bigger because when we're just living for ourselves, our lives are very small. 
But when we choose to love people, it expands our lives. There's room for God's hope, his joy, his life, his love, his purpose, his destiny when we choose to live a life of love and steadfast joy that can't be stolen from us no matter what. So this is what I encourage you to do this morning as we close. Um, I just want you right where you are, just close your eyes. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, God, what are you saying to me through this message? God, what are you speaking to me? Maybe you've come in and you feel like you're drowning in sorrow and you need Jesus to lift up your head, lift up your eyes. Maybe you uh, felt discouraged and disappointed by all these different hopes that have just never come through. Maybe your life has been really busy and you feel the Lord knocking on the door of your heart and saying, hey, will you make some room for me? Just right where you are, ask the Holy Spirit, God, what are you saying to me? And whatever God puts on your heart, I encourage you, write it down, put it in your phone, do do something with that. And then this week, Engage in that thing, whatever it is. If it's making space, do that in a small way. If it's coming to Jesus with your sorrow, make time, make space to do that. Whatever it is, let's listen to the Holy Spirit and let's respond in obedience. Amen? Would you stand with me? Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. What an incredible promise. God is with you. Wherever you are, no matter what's going on in your life, he's there. And all it takes is just a little bit of a turn of our attention just to acknowledge his presence. And just in that moment, he can meet you where you are and do something supernatural in your life. So let me pray over you. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your joy. Thank you, Lord, for a hope that cannot be touched, that transcends our circumstances and conditions, God. Thank you, Lord, that you are steadfast in your pursuit of us. And so, Lord, this morning, we say yes to you, Jesus. Give us grace, God, to make room in our hearts for you, Lord to encounter you in incredible ways this Advent season. And Lord, will you work in us a steadfast joy and may that joy be a light to the world. And we love you and we bless you this morning. Thank you, God, for my brothers and sisters in Christ here today. Bless them this week. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen, awesome. Well, thank you guys for being here. I want to remind you, uh, this week is it. It's Christmas Eve. It's coming Friday night, well, Friday afternoon, 3 p.m., 5 p.m. Please, we'd love to have you here. Bring your family, bring your friends. We're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. A big birthday party for Jesus. We're going to have fun. It's going to be awesome. Love you guys. Merry Christmas. Have a great week. We hope you've been encouraged this week. For more information or to submit a prayer request, go to denverunited.com.